بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والإكرام اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله في كل لمحة ونفس عدد ما وسيعه علم الله يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تؤاخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. We had a lot of rain last night and a lot of the streets are very difficult. So we were questioning whether we should begin now or wait until some people who are on their way can get here. Um, I think that you know we can just go ahead and begin now. And perhaps we can begin by reviewing certain things that are not clear. Um, one of the questions is about the preeminence of the prophets, as we talk about uh, in, in verse number two, and God who gave a special distinction through our prophet, the best of those having preeminence. And um, I think your question is about the word preeminence. Okay, so the word qadam here, which I've translated as preeminence, it means that they um, have a degree of excellence that is before anything else. So that's what it means. And preeminence means that they are eminent that they are great, and that they are highly honored and preeminent, that they are greater than anything else. And then we talked about that when we discussed the belief. Um, also, one of the questions that we have here is, um, how does change pr prove that something ha must have a beginning? Can you please explain how change necessarily implies that something has a beginning? I know that this is a fundamental principle in Aqidah, but I am having difficulty understanding the connection. Um, so, you know, this is something we've now talked about uh, every night, and I don't see any harm in our speaking about it again, because it's very fundamental. And as you know, the first belief that we discussed is Hamdan liman awjadana min al adam out of praise of God who gave us existence from non-existence. And on the first night and on the second night, uh, we talked about the belief of creation from nothing, the belief, belief in God's creating existence from non-existence, and we looked at revelatory proofs of that, like, Kan Allahu wa la shay'a ma'ahu, and we looked also at empirical evidence of that, um, such as um, the second law of thermodynamics, and then we looked also at the so-called Big Bang Theory, the expanding universe, the point universe, <clears throat> and uh, then we talked about the amazing nature of the atom, and that really the atom itself is a metaphor for space and time. It is essentially um, empty. Okay, so we talked about those. And um, inshallah, the lectures that have been given uh, will be made available to you if they have not already been made available to you. So you could go back and listen to those carefully if you have time. And I hope that would enable you to understand. We only gave one rational proof of the belief in the creation from nothingness. Is this okay? Yeah. And um, so we'll, let's just review that again. Is there anybody that would like to describe that to us? Instead of having me repeat it, is there anybody here that would like to try to explain that?
Okay, so in the Aqidah, the Aqidah is concerned with demonstrating the truth of revelation based on reason and based on experience. And it talks about the world that we all share in common. So therefore, when we're talking about the world and proving that it has a beginning, we're talking about the world that we see, the world that we hear, the world that we touch, the world that we taste, the world that we smell. And that world is made up of bodies and forms. It's a physical world. We believe that there is a spiritual world. And we believe in spirits, and we believe in angels, and we believe in the ruh. Okay, but we're not talking about that here, because also that is not discursive. In other words, it's not something that we share in common with those who believe and disbelieve. So we talk about the physical world. And we see that the physical world is made up of things. And these things are physical objects. And we can call them bodies, like this is a body. It's a corporeal body. Okay? Now, in analyzing these things, one of the amazing realities is that I never really see the thing itself. What I see when I look at the world is attributes of things. That's what's apprehendable. I see the color, I see the shape, I see the form, um, I see the material that it's made from, I, I see the weight, I perceive the weight, I see the space that it's in. Do you follow that? In other words, when I see the pin, do I really see the pin? We say I do, but in fact, we see the attributes of the pin. And this is why we also say in our theology, that these things have a substance, they have a reality that underlies them. That's what substance means originally, to substand, to stand below. And in Arabic we call that johar. We can also call it a that. Okay, but the fact is the johar of the qalam I don't ever see. And um, all that I see are attributes of the johar. And we define the Jawhar, you know, as that substance, that underlying reality of things that, is, that has the possibility of Kabul. It has the possibility of accepting attributes, of existing. For example, it accepts existence. It has a place that it occupies. It has color. It has form. It has weight. Okay, but all of those things are just attributes of the pin. Okay, so when I see this pillar, I only see attributes of the pillar. And right now the pillar is a yellowish color, and we could paint it, paint it black, right? And we come in and it's changed, but it's still the pillar. And we still know it's the same pillar. So this raises an interesting question of the nature of identity. But we don't have to go into that. We don't have time to go into that. But nevertheless, when we look at the world, the sun, the stars, we see attributes of them. We see the star, uh, the sun has these gases that are burning gases going through nuclear fission and shooting up, you know, uh, columns of burning gas, you know, thousands of kilometers into the sky. That's change. And the sun also moves. That's change. The mountains change, even though the mountains may look like they're stable, but in fact, they get smaller every year. They produce sand. They break down. So the world that we see is a world full of changes. And change is one of its essential attributes. The changes that we see in the world are always the changes of attributes. Right? So, um, this pin 
You know, we can change it in many ways, but we're just changing the attributes in the pen, pulling it apart, changing the color, changing the ink, whatever it may be. Okay? Now, when we look at a changing attribute, we say that it exists after not existing. Right? Isn't that the characteristic of all these changes? That this pen is here now, it has this color, it once wasn't here, it once didn't have that color. You know, if it's still in my hand now, that's, it wasn't that way a minute ago, a minute ago it was moving. So all of these changes, if we analyze them, they are beginnings and ends. Beginnings and ends. Okay, is that a problem? No. Okay? So, yes. Anything that has an end also will have a beginning. Okay? Uh, the only problem with that is that things that have beginnings can only exist because they are caused to exist. Okay, so they have to have a sufficient cause. And that cause, especially if we're talking about Allah Azza wa Jal, who is the cause of everything, then He can keep a thing in existence as long as He wills. And so you, for example, as a human being, are created from nothing. There was a time when you did not exist, and then you were made. But the secret of you is the spirit in you, which was also created. Spirits also change, spirits are also created, even if we can't see them. But we know by revelation that your spirit will never die. Your spirit was in a world before this, it's now in this world. When we die, we go into another dimension, which we call the barzakh, the intermediate zone, and then we have resurrection, and then we have eternal life. This is what we believe. This is what we believe, right? So we believe that ar-ruhu tabqa da'iman mad al-azal. You know, that the spirit, the human spirit, will last forever to the extent of eternity. But that's by the will of God. Okay, so you will not have an end. The life here will end, for sure. Okay, all of us know that. But the spirit in you, it will live on. Okay, this is what we believe by revelation, and this is not uh, impossible. This is a possibility. All right? But, you know, the thing is, is that all the things that we see are changing in the world. And therefore, by reason, we say that they must have beginnings. And the reason why we say that is because in the, my, in the mirror of intellect, the, the essence of this pin cannot be different from the essence of the attributes that it receives. Okay? So just as it has to have these attributes, it cannot exist without certain attributes. Okay? You know, it's got to have some weight, it's got to have a place, it's got, you know, it cannot exist as a body if it doesn't have a body. Okay, so in order for it to exist, it's got to receive these changing attributes. And so therefore, it must also be with a beginning. It must also have a beginning. Okay, so that is a step that we take. We see that the attributes all have beginnings, and we see that there is talazum, bain al-adsami wal a'rad. There is this talazum, there is this natural, necessary connection between these things that exist and between their changing attributes. And so therefore, نَحْكُمُ عَلَى الْأَجْسَامِ أَوَ الْأَجْرَامِ بِأَنَّهَا حَادِثَةً We rule that they also exist after non-existence. That is a rational argument. We may have to repeat it many times. And I think also that as we go forward, and we talk about other things, this will become easier. 
I hope that that will be the case because we're going to talk about other things where you should become more familiar with this way of looking at reality bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. So that's very, very important. Then as we said last time, and we had a very good question you know, that brought this up, that that which exists and has its origin in non-existence and then begins to exist, it is also muftaqir. We can say in English contingent. That's the word we use in English, contingent. And we can say dependent. You can use other words. But it means that it's got to have a cause. It cannot exist in and of itself. It cannot explain itself. It requires, and as, again we refer to the statement of one of our great scholars, ما لا وجود لذاته من ذاته فوجوده لولاه عين المحالي that that which cannot exist from its essence of its essence like this pin did it make itself does that make sense would anybody say that it's impossible the pin just made itself like that ما لا وجود لذاته من ذاته this pin you know it it, it cannot be its own cause of existence. فَوُجُودُهُ لَوْلَاهُ وُجُودُهُ لَوْلَاهُ Its existence. لَوْلَاهُ لَوْلَا وَاجِبِ الْوُجُودِ لَوْلَا الْخَالِقِ عَيْنُ الْمُحَالِ It is the very essence of impossibility. So it is مُفْتَقِر. And I am مُفْتَقِر. You are مُفْتَقِر. نَحْنُ فُقَرَاء إِلَى اللَّهِ we are fuqara in Allah, you know, in the sense that we are humble and we are modest and we're not proud and we thank God and so forth. But also that's my essential reality. Alhamdulillah, I'm here before you alive in, in this beautiful country, which I love very much. And I'm breathing. Can I guarantee my next breath? Can I guarantee my next heartbeat? Will I be here tomorrow night? I have no power over that, right? Do you? No, I'm a faqir. So this is my basic nature. And so the huduth then, the rational, qat'i, definitive proof that this world is hadith. And as we said, this is proved by modern science. Modern science also shows that, that this world all has a beginning. And they may say in expanding universe theory that it's 13.7 billion years, but that's still a beginning. It means that all this universe goes back to a point where it started. And it started from nothing. It started from a point, a dot. And you have infinite density, or potentially infinite density, which is the density of the sun and the planets and the stars and the universe. Where did that come from? A point? Not possible. Not possible if the only explanation is a material explanation. That is creation from nothing. Okay? And thermodynamics also shows us that, that this world cannot be eternal. Because if this world were eternal materially, then all the energy would have been dissipated. And all things would be the same. There would be no multiplicity, no stars, no trees, no birds, no human beings. All the same. Okay? These are really powerful things. But again, in intellect, you know, we look at the changing nature of attributes and we regard change as a fundamental proof of the temporality of the world. Al-wujudu ba'd al-adam. But that which exists after Adam, al-hadith, muftaqir. Muftaqir. It is contingent. It requires a sufficient cause. You know, and this is how we come then to what we want to talk about tonight, and that is muftaqirun ila mada. So it is contingent upon what? And if we see all this world, this universe, which is amazing, and we as modern human beings have the capacity to understand the astounding perfection of creation in a way that could only be imagined by people before us, you know, when Charles Darwin looked at the amoeba, 
which is, you know, this single-celled bit of jelly. To him, this is like the simplest form of existence, and, you know, it just happened. And he believed that, actually. That was a spontaneous creation. This was one of the theories that people had in the 19th century. And then it's like, what could be more simple than this piece of jelly? And now we know that the amoeba has DNA. And that the DNA that is in the amoeba is exactly the same type of DNA that you have in you. Or that the virus has in it. It's just that it's shorter. It's a shorter code. And it's a different code. But it's the same computer. How could that be? Impossible. Impossible that that could just happen. And this is something we'll study in more detail. Th these are miracles. These are miracles. So we understand today, you know, the wonder of creation in a way that people uh, may not have even understood it in the 19th century for sure, and in earlier ages. And um, in any case, so when we look at the world of al Hawadith, we look at the world of temporal things that exist after not having existed. al huwa al wujud ba'd al-adam. And this is the characteristic of this and of me and of every atom in my body and of you. Huh? So these things that are muftaqira, everything finite points to the infinite. Everything finite points to the infinite. That's why we call this an alam, right? It's a world because it's an alama. It is an alama, dalatun, ala man la mathira lahu. Okay, it is a sign that points to the one who is not like anything, who is not similar to anything, who is not partially similar to anything. And he cannot be hadith. He cannot be hadith. You cannot have an infinite series of finite causes. You know, again, if I look at this pin, this pin has a rabit, aqli, between it and its maker as long as the pin exists. As long as this pin exists, there is an intellectual link that is between it and its maker. Okay, and you know the maker of this, we're human beings. Okay, we don't, that's not a problem for us. But like this pin cannot account for itself. It could not have just happened. لا وجود له من ذاته Impossible. يعني, he, it has to have a maker. And its existence without a maker is عين المحالي. It is the very essence of impossibility. So as long as this pin exists, it indicates the existence of its maker. Now in its case, its maker was a human being, like you and me. Okay? And it tells us that that maker existed before it existed. It tells us that that maker existed up to the time at least of its existence. It tells us that that maker had life. It tells us that that maker had knowledge. Maybe not infinite knowledge, but certainly a lot of knowledge about metals and pins and writing and the human hand. And it tells us that that maker had a will to make the pin this design, to give it a silver coating, you know, to put in it a particular type of uh, refill, to make it a certain type of ink, right? That's will. And we know also that that maker had power, had the power to manufacture this pin, which they did with their machines and their their you know, factory and everything they had, and to market it and so forth, right? So this is the necessary relationship between the shape muftaqir wa ma yaftaqiru ilay. And the human being who made this pin, like you and me, is that human being able to account for himself? Like we are amazing creatures. You have a brain in your brain. You have more brain cells than there are stars in the heavens. And you never use but a very few of them. Why is that? It's amazing. You know, you have so many brain cells. And yet, usually we use very few of them. 
You know, the, the brain, the heart, this human heart also has in it cells that speak to the brain. And it just doesn't speak about emotions, it speaks about other things as well. And it actually functions in the nervous system even independent of the brain. The eye, it's amazing. This cannot be by chance. And yes, I have a father, I have a grandfather, I have a great grandfather. You know, you have a lineage that goes back thousands of years, right? But all of this has to have a beginning. There cannot be an infinite chain of finite causes. Like you say, well, I, the cause of my life is my father and my mother. Okay, you could say that. And then theirs is their mother and father. And you have a line that's going back in the path. But this also must have a beginning. Any sequence of imagined causes or real causes that we imagine, it must have a beginning. As we said last time, if you have an infinite chain of finite causes in the past, you would not be able to reach the present. You cannot cross an infinite set. So the fact that you are in the present moment, existing and caused, this is a proof of the fact that there is a beginning. Okay, and then we have also other proofs of that. So this is really important. And therefore, from the reality of Huduth al wujud ba'd al adam from the reality that this world is created from nothing, consensus of the ancient Jews, the prophets and the messengers, and the ancient Christians and of the Muslim Ummah, it requires a maker who is a sufficient maker. And this means that that maker cannot be hadith. That maker cannot be hadith. Otherwise you have an infinite series of causes going back to the past, which is impossible. The debt that is never paid. No, you have to pay the debt. You cannot cross an infinite set. You know, so this maker then must be radically and absolutely different than the world that he creates. لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَدٌ okay, This is what we believe on the basis of revelation. This is what the prophets of Israel taught and the prophets of ancient times. But this is also what the reason also dictates. This must be the case. And in the language of reason, we refer to that being who is the cause of all of these things as wajib al-wujud. And that's why he says in the verse that we began last night and we ended with, فَوَاجِبٌ لِرَبِّنَا الْوُجُودُ This is the first attribute. That God must exist and His existence must be necessary. What does that mean? It means that the pure it means that pure reason, the sound human intellect, when it reflects on the temporality of creation and the fact that these things cannot exist of themselves, it is obliged, it is forced, it is necessary for it to dictate that there is a one who exists who is not like anything and who exist outside the realm of temporality, who exists outside of time and place, and who has no beginning. Okay, that must be. This is a dictate of the human mind. And as we said before, um, one of the blessings of our religion is the fact that we are people who live within hudud, Right? This is our tartib rabbani that we have. So I live my life within the wajib shar'an and the haram I avoid and there are mandubat and there are makruhat and there are mubahat. I live my life that way as you do. Okay, so this means also that when I want to use the intellect, I'm empowered to do that. 
because once we live within parameters, then also we can embrace the intellect within parameters. So that when the intellect says, this is wajib, we accept it as such. That's not a problem for you when it comes to mathematics. Mathematics is all wajibat aqliya, nothing else. This is why you find people in mathematics that can learn it when they're seven years old. Friedrich Gauss, who was one of the great mathematicians of the 18th century, you know, he would sit on his father's lap. His father was a mathematician in Göttingen, and his father would be correcting advanced mathematics. And then when Friedrich Gauss was maybe seven years old, he began to correct his father. And you see this a lot, you know, in the history of mathematics and things like that, because mathematics is pure intellect. It does not require experience. It requires a very good mind, you know. But see, he can do that. Um, we don't have a problem with that. If I say that seven is an odd number and you don't have to have a laboratory to prove it, or if I say that, you know, the conjunction of the angles of a Euclidean triangle must always be 180 degrees, you study the theorems, you study the axioms, it doesn't require a laboratory, you know that it's true, that's necessary. Okay, but also, when we look at creation and we see that everything in creation exists in time and space, having a beginning, it is temporal. مَوْجُودٌ بَعْدِ adam يَفْتَقِرُ إِلَى سَبَبٍ And that cause that it is contingent upon must be sufficient. It cannot be like it. It cannot be of the same order of being. So therefore, in our aqidah, we necessarily posit, you know, as a dictate of the human mind, that there is wujudun wajib wa wujudun mumkin. You have that which is necessarily existent. Wajib al wujud. Okay, and this is the description of the one who is unlike anything in creation. God, Allah, Azza wa Jal. Okay, and then you have the world that exists, all of these worlds, the suns, the moons, the stars, the galaxies, the angels, all the things they are, all of them are hadithah, yani mawjudatun ba'd al-adam. Okay, so you have therefore the realm of possible being. And you have the realm of necessary being. And in the realm of necessary being, existence is necessary. And non-existence is impossible. And this is the, the, this is the characteristic of God, whose name is Al-Haqq. He is the one who's mutahaqqiqun wujudahu, you know, before all things, with all things, and after all things. And um, then you have the creation of the world itself. So in the world itself, which pertains to possible existence, all things that are mumkinat al-wujud, all things that have possible existence, we, call, we say that they have possible existence because in the beginning they have two possibilities. Right? Which is the possibility to exist and the possibility not to exist. So this cup exists, no question about that. When we say it's mumkin al wujud, we don't mean by that that there's any doubt that it's in my hand right now. Right? We don't mean that. But we mean that yahtamilu al wujud wal adam, that it has always the possibility of existence and non existence. It exists now, there's no question about that. At one time it did not exist. When was that? How would you know? How would I know? I didn't see the cup made. But this cup has attributes that change. The water right here is, is at this level. It used to be at this level before I drank from it. In a minute, maybe it has no water at all. You know, it's still, it's moving. So therefore, it also, because of the dictates of what change means, it is temporal. It exists after non-existence. Okay? And then at some times it can cease to exist as well. It always has those two possibilities. So everything in the world is like that. From the angels, from the arsh, ila al-farsh. From the throne of God to the most simple things 
on the surface of the earth. They have those two possibilities. But their origin is what? Non-existence. My origin, your origin, the origin of all these things is non-existence. They do not necessarily exist. But we know in our hearts, and we know through revelation, and we know through worship, and we know through akal, and we know by, by contemplating the world of experience that there must be one who accounts for this. And he must be utterly different necessarily existent. Um, okay, so uh, this first attribute, as we said, we call it sifatun nafsiya. We call it uh, a self-attribute. And we said yesterday that we could translate that as ontological attribute. And one of our wonderful students asked the question about what is ontology and ontology is the science of being okay so we can say this is an ontological attribute that it is an attribute that pertains to the very being of God the very essence of God himself and existence is then an attribute of God that is all by itself it's in a category that is unique it is an affirmative attribute because it affirms that the essence of God is, that the essence of God exists. Okay, but it doesn't tell us in itself about attributes like life, knowledge, will, and power. Okay, that we will talk about differently. That we will talk about distinctively. So when we come to talk about the attributes of God, and again, to repeat myself, um, you know, we, we have 13 basic attributes. And as we said many times, but it's important not to misunderstand it, God has infinite attributes. So we would never say that God just has these attributes and nothing else. But these are the attributes which our scholars, in a rich tradition, believe by their ijtihad, are the most basic that you have to understand in order to have a sound understanding of God. Okay, this is their ijtihad. And um, I honor that because I have great respect for them and I have great respect for my teachers who taught me what they teach. Okay, and again, you know, we could teach it in a different way. We could add other things. No problem with that. But we have to understand these 13 basic attributes. The first attribute, which is necessary existence, is the most fundamental of all. And many people would say that all the other attributes of God, the infinite attributes of God, they are all corollaries. They are all logical consequences of necessary existence. That if you understood the meaning of necessary existence, then you would get everything else right. But because we don't leave this up to people like me, who make mistakes, you know, then we want to spell it out. We want to talk about it so that we understand it very carefully. So you have, first of all, a sifatun nafsiyya. You have the ontological attribute, or if you want, the self-attribute. And that is necessary existence. And then after that, we have five attributes, which we call negative the negative attributes, as sifatu salbiya, aw sifatu sulub. Okay, why are they called negative attributes? Because they basically negate misconceptions. So the first of these is al qidam, pre-existence. Pre-existence means that the pre-existent being is in existence before anything else. That's what it means. And this is what qidam means. Qidam means, يَتَقَدَّمْ وُجُودُهُ عَلَى وُجُودِ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ And when we say that Allah is qadim, we don't mean He's old, because He's not in time and place. But we mean, يَتَقَدَّمْ وُجُودُهُ عَلَى وُجُودِ كُلِّ شَيْءٍ Okay? And al-qadim is one of the names of Allah in hadith. There are hadith that refer to Him as al-qadim. Yes. 
Hmm. Why don't you wait a minute on that? Okay, if you don't mind. Okay, because this is very important, but we're going to come to that. Okay? He's not in time and space. He is the Lord of time and space. He is the creator of time and space. Okay? So we'll talk about that, inshallah. Bi idhni Ida ahyana rabbuna. Okay, so you have five negative attributes, and these are al qidam. Qidam is, in English, pre existence. Pre existence. Meaning that God exists before anything and everything. He pre exists the world. And then we have al baqa, which is everlastingness, that He never ceases to exist. He exists at all moments. Okay, so why is qidam a negative attribute? Because it negates what? Huduth, and therefore it negates beginning. That God has no beginning. How can that be? How can that be? You have a beginning, I have a beginning, the sun has a beginning. How can there be one who has no beginning? And again, this is where the aql is very important. And this is why the, the deen of Islam is a deen of pure intellect. Because this is a necessary conclusion. This is ma'qul. This is wajib. Yani it's min al ma'qul al wajibat. Ma'qulat al wajibat. Okay, we have to posit this. There's no way that we can explain this world which is utterly temporal, unless we, unless we affirm that there is a being that is totally unlike them and who has no beginning. And that being has no analogy. He cannot be like anything. He is your Lord. He is your ma'bud bihaq. Okay? But this is his reality. So he has no beginning. And when we say he has baqa, which is salbu madha. What do we negate when we say baqa? So we say no end. Wal awwal wal akhir. And then we have dissimilarity. Khulfuhu li khalqihi. That he is utterly unlike his creation. Utterly. So here again, it is a negative proposition. That God is not like me. God is not like you. God is not even like the angels. You know, you have the angel Gabriel, Jibreel, you know, man of God. That's what Gabriel means. Gabra'il. Gabra'il. The man of God. Like Rajulullah. But not like gender. It's like he is the servant of God. Absolute. The greatest of the angels. And then you have Mikael. What does Mikael mean? In Hebrew, in Aramaic, mi is like Arabic ma. And ka is ka. And il, which they say el, is machael. He is not like God. So Michael is a beautiful angel. Michael is the manifestation of Jamal. And Michael always brings bounty and good. God created him that way. God creates as he wills. Gabriel, you have to be careful. Gabriel destroys also. That's why they say the children of Israel are always like Michael. He never brings bad news. And Gabriel, they don't like that. Because he sometimes brings very bad news. You see, but Mikael is Makallah. Laysa kemithlila, lestu kemithlila. That's what his name means. Because he is beautiful. He is spectacular. And the ancient Jews, they loved to write about Michael and the glory of Michael, the greatness of Michael. But Laysa kemithlila. Because Allah is al Quddus. He is Subuh al Quddus. Subuh means that he is free of any defect, like evil. He does no evil. He creates evil. He does no evil. We'll talk about that, inshallah, in its own time. But he is, you know, nusabbihu, subhanallah. He is not, he cannot, no defect can be attributed to him. He's quddus. What does quddus mean? Quddus means that he is also unlike the most beautiful thing that you can imagine. Michael, anything greater, the throne, 
the beautiful flower, you know, that blossoms on a spring day. And it's just like the epitome of beauty. Is this like God? No. Even in its beauty, it is not like God. He is the Qudus, Yataqaddis, Qudus, and Qudus, and Qudus. Okay? So dissimilarity. Dissimilarity is a negative attribute. And we will talk a lot about that. Because it is one of the most important of all. And it is the one that enables us to understand the nature of possible being. Because this is what is very important, you know, that how can I understand necessary being? I can only say it must be. It is. And my heart knows that. And your heart knows that. Okay? Then we have after that, but the thing I can understand is the realm of possible being. Yes? No, it doesn't mean contradiction. It's, it's, it's nefi, salb. It negates. It means God. You say, la ilaha illallah. It's salb. There is no God but God. Okay, there is nothing like God. So that's salb. As we say, you begin with takhliya. And then you have takhliya. You know, first you have to clean the slate. First you have to remove illusion and delusion. And then after that, you adorn with the understanding of beautiful attributes. So you have then al qiyamu bin nafs. al qiyamu bin nafs. This is the fourth negative attribute. What does it negate? Need. Sorry? Need. So again, ana muftaqidun fi kulli shay. Every atom in my body is muftaqir. For every breath, you know, I am muftaqir. He is the one who by essence is complete and completing. He is the one by essence who has all and can give all. This is his necessary attribute. He has no need whatsoever. He does not need instruments. He does not need computers. He has angels that he created as all the prophets and the world's religions have told us, who record things and who do different things, and he doesn't need any of them. They are just there as a testimony to his glory and to his justice. Okay, and then you have the last negative attribute, which is wahdaniya, oneness, which negates that there be a second or a third, which also negates that God be made up of parts, that you have internal plurality, external plurality, and this is among the most important. So we talk about that. You have five negative attributes. So you understand why they're called negative. And then you have what are called the ma'ani. And the ma'ani means they are substantial attributes. They are real attributes. And these are life, al-haya. And then ilm, Knowledge, infinite knowledge. And then will, al-irada, al-mashi'ah. Okay, and we'll talk about all of these. And then you have qudra, power. And then you have sam' and basar, hearing and seeing, all that exists. He sees the sounds, he hears the color. He sees everything that exists exactly as it exists. The surface, the interior, everything. Total perception of the creation that he created and also of his perfect essence. And then you have the last of the ma'ani, which is what? Which is the... Huh? Speech, al-kalam. Beautiful. So inshallah we talk about these. These seven attributes are also in three pairs. So life is by itself. We usually talk about it first. And then you have two attributes that are like twins, if you can say that. Probably I shouldn't say that. They're pairs. I won't say that. That's not nice to say. Okay, but these are knowledge and what? What is the pair of knowledge? Huh? What? Nelly, what is it? Speech, speech, 
And we'll talk about why that's the case. Knowledge and speech relate to exactly the same things. This is beautiful. And the nature of knowledge is al kashfu min ghayri khafa. It reveals, it demonstrates, you know, without any preceding obscurity. Okay, and then you have al kalam al kalam yadul. That's the only difference. Al kalam yadullu ala al ma'lum. It points to, you know, what is there in knowledge, and this is very important. And we'll talk about this. And I hope you'll enjoy it. To me, it's intoxicating. And then you have will. And what does will do? Will designates that things will be just as they are. This cup will exist in this moment with this amount of water. That's called tachsis. Tarjih and tachsis. And it does tarjih, which means it gives it existence over non-existence. Because both are possible for it, and it cannot, it cannot change that on its own. It's got to have tarjih, it's got to have the function of a will that gives it the predominance of existence over non-existence. And then it's got to have tachsis, and we'll talk about that, it's very important. You know, very important, tachsis, very important. There cannot be random chance. Inshallah, I'll sh- you'll understand this if you don't understand it already. You do intuitively. And then, so those go together. Irada and its pair is what? Qudra, power. And then you have as sam'u wal basal They go together. They're all very different. We'll talk about them, inshallah. So we have these attributes. And again, tonight, we introduce necessary being. And everything that we will say about the attributes of God is a commentary on necessary being. Okay, and this is a really important cognitive frame. Again, these are understandings that we have. We call them frames, you know, that enable us to think. And they enable us to speak intelligently. And they enable us to understand bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. And one of the most important of those is the radical distinction between necessary being and between possible being. And inshallah, this may be new to you, and it may not be, but um, be patient, because if it is new to you, you will understand it. It just, it usually takes time. It takes time to, we're talking about new concepts for many people, and you can't just take that in and, oh, got it. Some people can, but most people can't. It takes time. We have to become familiar with it, and as we go through this discourse, inshallah, it becomes more and more Familiar with the Ithnilahi Ta'ala. Um, necessary being is beyond comprehension. This attribute of Allah and every attribute of Allah is beyond your comprehension. As we said before, Imam al Haddad, may Allah be pleased with him, he said that the disbeliever, yatahayyaru fil khalq, the disbeliever is confounded by creation. You know, and we gave examples of that. And creation, today you look at, it's amazing. I mean, look at the virus. You know, the virus, you know, we don't even know if it's a living thing. It's like a little tiny staff. You know, and it gets into your body. And it finds its way to the, way to the cell. And it finds the opening to the cell. And it goes into the opening of the cell. And then it goes into the DNA. And then it takes over the DNA and it uses the DNA to produce itself. What is that? What is that? Amazing. And this is a tiny virus. We don't even know how old they are. They may be millions of years old. And we don't even know if we can call them living or dead. And you know, they, if they are living, they are the most simple of all living things. And yet virus diseases are some of the most difficult of all. They overtake the whole DNA. So, you know, netahayyar, you know, if we look at the world, it is mutahayyar. But al-mu'min yatahayyar fil khaliq. But the believer is confounded by the Creator because he is al-akbar, he is al-kabir, and everything with regard to him is sabir. Everything with regard to him is muftakir. 
everything with even the greatest of all things. Okay, so necessary being then is not knowable. It is unknowable. But so is the knowledge of God. So is the will of God. So is the power of God. You know, the essence of God is not knowable. But you can know valid truths about God, especially if you know yourself. And if you know the nature of possible being, which is the world that you belong to, the world of analogies, the world of how and what and why and where, okay, this is what we can understand. And inshallah, this will become clear uh, as we go forward, if it's not already clear to, to you at this time. So, uh, necessary existence is more manifest than anything. Necessary existence, this is manifest, right? You see this. This pin is manifest. Does anybody not see it? Necessary existence, which is God's existence, is more manifest than this. Who will zahir? Who will zahir? There is nothing more zahir than he. But he's not in time and space. He is not in time and space. He is the Lord of time and space. He is closer to me than my juggler vein. But he is not in me. And he's not outside of me. These are the ways that we learn to speak about him so that inshallah we can speak accurately. And what we're really talking about is ourselves. That he's not like me. He doesn't have the attributes that I have. Necessary being is more manifest than anything. Necessary being is more hidden than anything. It is batin. He is al-zahiru al-batin. It is more hidden than anything. Necessary being is perfect. Absolutely perfect. There is no increase and no de decrease. And it is unchanging. Necessary being does not change. There is nothing to change it. Change has no meaning with regard to it. Necessary being is what changes. And we will talk about this bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. How do we explain that? Okay, but it is perfect. It is unchanging. It cannot be stronger. It cannot be weaker. It cannot be more perfect. It cannot be less perfect. It is infinite in its perfection. Infinite in its reality. Okay, and this is why as you approach it, you approach on a journey that never ends. And in order to approach, you've got to have the right foundation. And this was the purpose of this theology that we study. To give all Muslims, men and women and children, you know, the, the right basis upon which to speak about God, to think about God, to worship God, to do dhikr of God. And then to come to know him more and more and more and more. And that never ends. And as we said before, you know, you were created to be happy. You were created to be filled with ecstasy. You were, be created, to be, you were created to be fulfilled. But the only way that can happen is to know your Lord. Man wajid Allah lam yafqud shay'an. Wa man faqad Allah lam yajid shay'an. Okay, so um, may Allah give us that... The, that gift. Absolute being, necessary existence, is absolute good. Not evil. Absolute good. Although God in his wisdom creates Satan and he creates evil. And we will talk about that. But necessary existence is absolute good. It is absolute mercy. It is absolute light. In fact, one of the names of Allah that speaks of his wujud wajib is an-nur. He is an-nur. He is al-haq. He is an-nur. And absolute being is out of space and time. It is not in space and time. It is the Lord of space and time. Kan Allahu wa la shay'a ma'ahu. God was and there was with him nothing as our Prophet said sallallahu alayhi wa and as Imam al-Junaid al-Sadiq said in his commentary on the hadith, وَهُوَ الْآنَ عَلَى مَا عَلَيْهِ كَانْ He is now as he was then. God does not change. 
Okay? And how he relates to the world, these are the things that we talk about. When we talk about life, knowledge, speech, will, power, hearing and seeing in the light of the negative attributes. But this is mutahayr. And you have to be strong to accept that. This is why we say that when God wants to guide a man or a woman to the truth, yashrah sadrahu lil Islam, right? That he expands your heart. Because the heart has to be big to accept the truth. You know, when the heart is filled with shubuhat, when it is filled with dubious understandings, doubtful and false understanding, then it becomes tight. When it has shukuk, it also becomes narrow. And it's not able to reach out. It's not able to accept the truth. Okay, so the heart has to be big to accept the truth. And you have that. This is what comes with this beautiful deen that we have. This deen of purity, purification, husnul dhan, living a good life, living a proper life, you know. And then we are able to grow and to grow and to grow um, in, in these realities. Okay, so Allah is outside of space and time. And we will talk about this, you know, that uh, God is not in me and he's not outside of me. God is not touching me, and he's not not touching me. God is not connected to me or disconnected from me. This is all a misconstrual. He is closer to me than my juggler vein, but he's not in space and time. And these are powerful truths, powerful realities, which inshallah will explain more as we continue. Okay? So um, then after that he says... Um, so he says, So he now goes into the negative attributes. Um, Thus it is necessary that our Lord have one existence, necessary existence. Then two pre-existence, al-qidam, and three everlastingness extended to infinity. So here you have two negative attributes. The first of them is qidam. And this is that God's existence, which is necessary, which is uncaused, which is not an analogical to anything that you have ever seen or heard or imagined, it also must exist before the existence of everything contingent absolutely necessary. Okay, this must be. And this is what the prophets taught us. Okay, so he has the attribute of qidam, which negates beginning. And because it negates beginning, it also negates cause. And because it negates cause, it also means that there is nothing to qualify his being. There is nothing to make him less or make make him greater. He is perfect in his existence. Okay, and the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that between God and creation are 70,000 veils of light and darkness. Okay, between God and creation are 70,000 veils of light and darkness. Some people say light and darkness, some people say they are Jamal and Jalal, they are beauty and majesty. And if creation heard any of them rustle, it would cease to exist. So this is a teaching that we have from our Prophet ﷺ. And it's very beautiful because it shows us also that the contingent world, the world of possible being, which is the only world that you and I know, which is filled with all of these beautiful things, and which is miraculous, and which includes the universe, with all the galaxies and all the stars and all the worlds, that it is like a thimble. You know, it's like, you know, the thimble is. The thimble is what you put on your finger when you sew. You know? So it, like, it exists in a thimble. It is not big with regard to God. It is not small with regard to God. And its multiplicity is not confusing or difficult with regard to Him. This is all, these are all functions of necessary being. 
Okay, so but between God and creation are 70,000 veils of light and darkness. If any of them would be heard to rustle, the thing would cease to exist. These are big, powerful realities. Gabriel himself, in one of the hadiths of the night of Mi'raj, he says that I cannot go beyond Sidr al-Muntaha because between me and God are 70 veils. Not 70,000, but 70. And again, if I heard any of them rustle, I would cease to exist. Okay, so these are beautiful prophetic truths and they tell us about the nature of contingent reality. That it is a miracle that it exists. It exists by the qahar of God. It ex and it is totally contingent upon God in every moment. Um, okay, so he has uh, no beginning, he has no end, he has no cause. There's nothing to qualify his existence Okay, there's nothing that affects it in any way. He is the self-existent one. Then uh, we have after that al-baqa, and al-baqa is that he is everlasting. Again, in terms of pure intellect, once we posit that the one has necessary existence, then non-existence in his right is impossible. His being is not caused, it does not rely on cause. It cannot be qualified and changed. Therefore, it exists forever. That which exists with no beginning also exists with no end. Okay? Do you have a question about words? Yeah. Yes. Necessary existence is very understandable. But that's not a question about words. That's a question about questions. No, it's about this. No mm -hmm. beginning, you say. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is the nature of necessary being, right? That this world, which is a world of things, all of them having beginnings, and all of them coming from non-existence to existence, the sufficient cause that brings them into existence and that can explain them, it must be without beginning. God has no beginning. This is a rational necessity, which is, and many philosophers have said that, like John Locke, that this is as cogent, this is as binding as saying that one and one is two. Or saying that the sum of the angles of a Euclidean triangle is 180 degrees. It must be so. And again, the nature of that God, who has no beginning, who has no end, who necessarily exists, this is beyond your comprehension and mine. We will never know the essence of God. We can never understand the nature of His essence. But we can and we must posit that He exists with no beginning. He exists necessarily. He does not pertain to the realm of possible being. He has no beginning. He has no end. And he also has no similarity to anything that exists in the realm of possible being. Okay, so this is wajibun aqli. And this is, you can say, awwal al wajibat al aqli. Again, to be able to do this and to hold this, we have to have aql. And that aql has to be buttressed in a lifestyle that we lead, you know, that enables us to hold to the necessity of the necessary and to posit the impossibility of the impossible and to hold to the possibility of the possible. Okay? Um, now, questions at this time have to be about words. In other words, if I'm saying a word that you don't understand, then ask. But if it's about these discussions, I'd like to have those questions that come at the end. So, what is your word that you're asking about? Veils, yeah. Yeah, right. Veils, ba, ba. Veils. Right. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So then we go to the next attribute. Wa khulfuhu li khalqihi thumma al ghina. So he says uh, his dissimilarity from his creation, then self sufficiency. D 
dissimilarity from his creation than self-sufficiency. So now we have four negative attributes. Pre-existence, everlastingness, dissimilarity, and uh, we have self-sufficiency. Okay? And we'll talk about each of those. So among his names, Azza wa Jal, is Al-Quddus, Al-Salam, Al-Ali, Al-Majid, Al-Majid, uh, Al-Subuh, Al-Quddus. All of these are names that speak about dissimilarity, that God is utterly dissimilar from his creation. And we say of God, that we cannot validly ask about him uh, questions like how, why, because this is the question that comes up, how can he exist without a beginning? That you can never explain. Bila kaif. Because you have no analogy to understand that. But by the aql, you must affirm that. Just as you have to affirm that one and one is two. Okay, this is a proposition that you know in your heart. God, out of mercy to you and me, created, with, created you with a fitrah that believes. And also, you know God. Because in the world before this world, which was the alam al-arwah, the alam al-dar, you know, we did tawaf around the throne of God. We knew God. And then at the end of that period, he brought us together in the plain of Arafat, and he brought us as, as little, like dhar, and he said, Alastu bi rabbikum, am I not your Lord? He spoke to us with his uncreated speech. Okay, so we know this. This is stamped upon our heart. It is my fitra. It is your fitra. Um, I remember when, I've, you know, when I was at the University of Michigan many years ago, um, you know, we were living in the student housing. I was a new professor, very poor. And uh, my wife was a graduate student, so we lived in student housing. And we had lots of Muslims that lived with us there. It was very nice. It was a beautiful time of our life. And, you know, in the housing, uh, there was a woman who was a graduate student. She was actually a law student. And she was a feminist in those days. This was a long time ago. Uh, there weren't that many feminists. It was a, like a new movement. So she was a feminist. She was a law student, she was divorced, she had a little boy, who was about maybe two or three, and she liked us, I don't know why, and we liked her, and we would talk a lot, and she's very argumentative, and she was very anti-religion, for her religion has nothing good to say, and religion is a source of oppression and tyranny of women and of other things, okay? So that was her position. And it happened that one day, you know, uh, we were in a grassy area, and we were talking, it was a spring day, and um, she's talking about atheism, and about religion, and how bad it is, and so forth, as she always does. And her son was playing. And then he got further away. And finally, there were cars that were on the street. Uh, he went between the cars on the street, and then she noticed that that's where he was, and there was another car, that was coming down the street very fast, and he was going out to be right in front of the car. And what did she do? She said, oh my God! She said, oh my God! Just like that. And the car screeched, you know, and the, it swerved, and the, and the boy escaped just by an inch. How did he escape? He came running back to his mother, crying. Okay, but this is a, a sign of what? The fitrah. Because in that state of iltirah, and of, you know, like, she loves her son. And like, it's like, what, he's going to be killed. You know? And so that it's like, all this talk, it ends, and she says, oh my God, like that. And, and then he's saved, because whoever calls upon Allah in iltirah, you know, he answers their, their prayer. So then he comes back, that was the end of the conversation. She takes him, she hugs him, she goes home, you know. Then a week later she's the same person, <laughs> talking about how terrible religion is and so forth, I don't believe in God, you know. But the fitra is there. And this fitra comes out of us in times of fear 
and also shauq, when we have really strong desires and passions or happiness, things happen that are really beautiful. But it is there, we know that. And the human mind is created to be able to grasp these realities and to be able to dictate to us these truths and then we follow them bi ithnillahi ta'ala. So Allah Azza wa Jal is utterly dissimilar. We cannot ask of Him questions of how, why, what, where, when. As we say, you know, Allah is utterly bila kayf. He is utterly without how. Because all of these words which are meaningful for you and me, these are the way that we discover reality. What is this? Why is this? How is this? Where is it? When is it? All of these are questions about analogies. They are all questions that place things in relative positions to other things. And none of that applies to God. Because He is utterly shape. He has no likeness. He has no shariq. He has no shabi. He has no nadir. He has no mithil. Um, God is not moving. God is not still. Not like a physical body. Now, of course, when we say that, this raises a natural question that what about things like Nuzulullah ta'ala ila as al-ula in the night. So we'll talk about that. These are called mutashabihat. And these have to be understood properly, soundly. This is part of our nasiha with the Quran. You know, because Adinu Nasiha. Liman, Lillahi, Wali Kitabihi, Wali Rasulihi, Wali Aimmat al Muslimin, Wali Ammatihim. Okay, but part of the nasiha of the Quran is to believe it and to honor it, to respect it, to have adab with it, but also to build our understanding of it on the muhkamat and to understand the mutashabihat in terms of that. So we say that God is not moving like a physical body, like this pin is moving. He's not still either. These oppositions are oppositions that pertain to things that are located in space and time. He is not physically close like a body. He is not physically far away. He is not a body. Okay? He is not made of parts. He is not big like a giant is big or something like that. He is Al-Kabir who is greater than all creation and all creation with regard to him as Saghir is insignificant and dependent. Uh, God is not transcendent, transcendent meaning in a lot of theological discourse outside the world. And he is not imminent, meaning that he's not in the world. He is not in the things, in the trees, in the water. Uh, God is not indwelling, he is not outdwelling. All of this is to speak about God in temporal terms as if he were in time and space. Uh, God is not in me, he is not outside of me. God is not touching me, he is not touching me. He is not connected to me, he is not disconnected from me. Okay, this is dissimilarity. And again, what this is telling us in many different ways is that all that you understand about the realm of possible being, in the realm of possible being, of physical bodies, they're either close or they're far away. I'm either touching it or not touching it. Uh, it's either to my right or to my left, to my front, to my back, over my head or under me, right? It's either moving in its place or still. But these categories, you know, which are the attributes of things in time and space, they are not the attributes of God. He is closer to you than you. He is closer to every atom in your body than that atom itself. He is closer to you in your juggler vein, but bila kaif, not in a way that is like he's inside you or he's touching you or anything like that, okay? Um, God is not a gender. He has no gender. He's not male. He's not female. Um, God does not belong to a species. He doesn't belong to a domain. He doesn't belong to a kingdom. 
Uh, he doesn't belong to a genus. All of those types of categories, which are valid when we talk about minerals and we talk about plants and animals and things in the created world, they do not pertain to him, Azzawajal. He is not a spirit. He is the creator of the spirit. He is the creator of the spirits. A God is not nature. Okay? He is not a force. You know. um, God is not energy. He is the creator of energy, which is one of the most fundamental properties of the physical universe. Um, and God is, of course, not like us. So any anthropomorphic understanding of God that understands him as being a human being or like a human being, this is fundamentally against the teaching of the prophets. God um, um, cannot be located. We cannot say that he's in one place. You know, because again, again, when we talk about the, the verses that speak about the throne of God and things like that, uh, we will talk about that, how they are to be understood, but God is not delimited in space and time. Okay, these are mutashabihat. Um, now, one of the important things about dissimilarity is the fact that with regard to God, nothing is big and nothing is small. In terms of the world that you and I live in, everything is relative. So for us, when we talk about the atomic world, the atomic world is infinitesimally small. Okay, and when we talk about ourselves, then you know, we are all relative to each other. Okay, and when we talk about uh, the stars and the planets, we're talking about things that are huge. But that is all relative to you and me. With regard to God, everything that he creates, he relates to with exactly the same perfection. With exactly the same rububiya and uluhiya. So therefore, in his right, the Adam, which he knows he created as small with regard to him, to you and me, it is not small with regard to him. He relates to it as perfectly, as if it were the only thing that existed. And when he relates to the galaxy and to the eons of time that the galaxy exists in, he relates to it with exactly the same perfection that he relates to the atom or the human being. Um, for him, nothing is far away, nothing is near in a physical sense. He relates to all of it perfectly. Uh, for him, nothing is complex. Nothing is difficult, even though the world that he creates is a world of infinite multiplicity. All the leaves on the trees, all the hair on your head, all the fish in the seas, okay, multiplicity upon multiplicity. Yet, in his dissimilarity, he relates to all of that as if it were the only thing. He relates to all of it perfectly, and to every atom in it, to every molecule in it. With him there is no difficulty. Um, God relates to all creation with the same perfection, as if it were one on one. Okay, um, now this is a place where it's important for us you know, to talk about the way that we perceive the world we live in uh, in the modern age. As we said when we began, you know, one of the characteristics of um, you know, modern thought in the last two centuries in the West is the fact that empirical knowledge has become virtually the only form that's acceptable. And empirical knowledge dominates everything. Reason-based knowledge is only allowed to the extent that it serves the dictates of empirical knowledge. So to talk about how this watch is temporal because it changes, we're not taught to do that. And we're not welcome to do that either. In this world of empirical knowledge, which is not complemented 
by knowledge of revelation or by knowledge of reason, pure reason, uh, then you get certain illusions that take place. And one of these illusions that we are confronted with continually as modern human beings is the idea of the total insignificance of human beings. Because when we look at the universe, we see that compared to everything else in the universe, this earth that we live on is like a speck of dust. And the galaxy, the Milky Way, the solar system that it's in is just one of how many other solar systems. And this solar system is in a galaxy which is huge for you and me, and it's just like a drop in the ocean compared to the universe. Okay, so this creates the illusion in modern empirical human beings that we are really insignificant. We are how many billion people on this tiny speck of dust that is lost in the universe. So then what does it matter if we kill, if we rob, if we destroy, if we kill 60,000 or 100,000? You know, what can these ethical values possibly mean? Okay, this is an illusion. And it is an illusion that comes out of a world that only knows quantification. It does not know quality. It cannot relate things to their qualities. It only relates them to the Empirical science, in order for it to work and to use mathematics, it has to generalize about things, it has to quantify things, it has to enumerate things, and it sees that some things are very big and some things are very small. Okay, and so then you get this vision of the world, which is like a nightmare. This is one of the nightmares of modern human beings. That like, who am I then? And what is my significance? And then what could be the meaning of my life? In a world where I am so insignificantly small. And this is also where the belief in God the necessary thing, and the belief in his negative attributes, especially dissimilarity, is absolutely important. Because then when we see this world one on one with its creator, who accounts for it, the necessary thing, who relates to every particular, every atom, every electron, every planet, every atom, every planet, every solar system, every a galaxy with the same perfection. There is no many and few anymore. There is no big and small anymore. And then we come back to a position which is correct and real, which is that the human being is very special in all of this. As we said before, the prophets and the messengers, in our prophet is the best of those who have preeminence. That there are created beings, these are prophets and messengers, who are greater than the angels. And you know, they're, no, they're not bigger than you and I. And they're certain, you know, but they are the center of that world that God created. Because in the world that He created, a big and small, a vast and few, these are the most perfect of all of those things that He created. And they are in the center of all of that. Okay? So this is very, very important because of the fact that this enables us to um, escape from that nightmare of quantification, which is, you know, uh, one of the realities of the one-dimensional man's perception of the world. And that's not true. This world, in all of its detail, in all of its big and small, you know, it relates to God perfectly in the same way. And all of the things that are in it that relate to him also relate to him as creator and creation. Okay, so that's that's a very important point. Um, should we stop here and have questions? Take the pause. Okay, so do uh, you want to stop here and take a break? And then we come back to the last night and we can ask questions. Okay, let's do that. Is that all right? Well, one more time.
said, uh, then we will have another 30 or 40 minutes where we can take questions. Again, I appreciate it if you write the questions now. If you want to ask it, that's also all right, but I'd like to have a, a record of it. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, and Sallallahu Ala Sayyidina Muhammadin, wa Ala Alihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam. اللهم افتح علينا بحكمتك وانشر علينا برحمتك يا ذا الجلال والكرام اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تؤاخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي صلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. Uh, we have lots of questions. Um, this one says, how do we define necessary? Is it by observing all the instances of its existence and then deeming that existence cannot be cannot happen otherwise. If that is so, doesn't that mean that the necessary is passing into the realm of customary experience? So one of the definitions of the aql and of the conclusions of the aql is that they are independent of experience. And uh, that, that's how we make the distinction between things that are known by customary experience and things that are known by Aql. Things that are known by Aql do not require laboratories. They do not require um, historical knowledge. They require only the examinations of meanings and propositions. Uh, this is the way that numbers work. This is the way that quantities works, work in geometry, uh, designs, and things like that. So uh, necessity is independent of experience. And the categories of the intellect are before experience. They are the means by which we understand experience. Um, if God doesn't have a gender, why do we refer to him as he in English and huwa in Arabic? Why don't we have something that, sig signif that signifies him solely? Um, we ha this is a good question, and we have another question here which is somewhat similar to it. Um, if we were to refer to God as he, um, you know, then it would definitely be feminine. You know, this is definitely tied to the feminine gender. Uh, huwa in Arabic is a broader term, and we refer to angels that way too, but the angels do not have gender. And ultimately what we say is that these are tawqifi things. These are things that are established by revelation, and they pertain to the type of reverence that we show to God. If we referred to God in any other way that is contrary to the way that we refer to each other, uh, then he would become impersonal. And that is also false, because God is a personal God, and God relates to us as a living, knowing, merciful God. So ultimately this is a tawqifi matter, but we understand very well that God does not have gender, just as angels also do not have gender. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah, and this is why we say tawqifi. Tawqifi means it is established that way in the revelation. So all the prophets spoke of God this way. All the revelations spoke of God that way. After we establish that Allah is mukhalifun al hawadith, doesn't a problem arise when we speak about God and attempt to describe Him with words? Words are used to describe created beings. Is this something we allow because it is minbab al darura to be hul mahdura, or al darura to be hul mahdurat? Example. Humans have ilm, and Allah has ilm. And even though Allah's knowledge is utterly different from ours, there is still wajhu uh, shabah in the same word being used. So, very good question. And it's like the question that we just had: that how do we refer to God, you know, by words like huwa? 
<clears throat> and um, you know that again in the aqidah this is something that we will talk about tomorrow inshallah we talk about the mutashabihat we talk about those things in revelation that speak of God in terms that are similar to human beings and similar to this world. So we talk about the hand of God, the eye of God. Uh, in Hadith you have even the foot of Al-Jabbar. We talk about um, the hearts of the believers being between the two fingers of the Most Merciful. Um, Ar-Rahman ala al-Arsh istawa God, the All-Merciful, assumed the throne. All of these are verses that are mutashabihat. That means that they are similar to creation. They speak of God in ways that are similar to creation. And uh, our position on that we'll talk about in detail tomorrow, bi'ibnillahi ta'ala. But this is a very important thing. And indeed, um, you know, there is always the problem of language. That the language that we use in speaking about the world that we know, how do we relate that to God? And, uh, you know, the, the Arabic language in particular, which is the vehicle of Quranic revelation, this is a language which is perfectly fashioned to speak about God. And in the Aqidah, this is one of the main things that we have to do. That if we talk about seeing God, which we believe in, what does that mean for you and me? And does that, are we speaking of God like we see the pillars that are here before us in the room? Or can it have another meaning? When we speak about the speech of God, the uncreated speech of God, is that letters? Is it sounds? Is it Arabic? Is it Hebrew? Does it have grammar? So here, you know, we understand that the, the knowledge of God, the vision of God, even God seeing creation, these are utterly different than the same attributes that we have by the same names. And yet, these attributes that we have, like speech and knowledge, hearing and seeing, will and power, you know, they are adequate for us to understand these realities and to relate them to the divine. And this is the purpose of theology. It is to be able to enable us using this created language and this language which we usually use to talk about a world that is analogical in a way that is valid regarding God. Um, it's a very good question and it's a very big question. And again in theology, we talk about this in a limited way. And we usually define the fact that these words, as we use them with regard to God, they have meanings that are greater or different than the meanings that they have in, a, in our customary experience. But in reality, there is a, a compatibility here, you know, which is absolutely profound. <clears throat> is the fact that God exists outside of time and space? Um, okay, how are, we, how, we, how are we able to rationalize, explain how man can have free will, and at the same time, all of humanity's fate be written, known by God? Could you elaborate if this is the case? Free will versus predetermination. This is a very important issue. It is one of the most important aspects of Aqidah and it is something that we hope to discuss in detail um, over the nights ahead bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. Especially when we talk about the oneness of God, the oneness of the act of God, and then when we talk about God's knowledge and His will and His power. Um, we won't go into that in detail tonight, but this will be something that inshallah we will be able to deal with. We will give it attention. Um, this is a question that was asked, this, the question of free will is a question that came up in the days of Imam Ali, Karramallahu Wajhahu, 
And uh, there are beautiful statements attributed to him and also to Imam al Hassan, his son, in which he says, Al Amru Bain al Bain. Al Amru Bain al Bain. They ask him about Qadr. So he says, Al Amru Bain al Bain. The reality here is between two extremes. La Jabra wa la Tafweed. La Ikraha wa la Tasleed. Okay, so there is no Jabr, there is no compulsion. God does not make you sin. And God does not make you obey when you don't want to obey. You're not majboor. Wala uh, tafweed. Nor does God turn over creation to you. He is the Lord. Nothing happens in the world but what He has willed and what He has known from pre existence and what he has power over. وَلَا um, إِكْرَاحٍ And you're not made to do anything you don't want to do. وَلَا تَسْلِيقٍ Nor are you empowered to create actions as if you were a god. So this is <clears throat> one of the biggest, if not the biggest questions of all religious communities. That how do we affirm the oneness of God, the necessary being of God, the infinite total knowledge of God, the will of God that pertains to everything, every leaf that falls from the tree, and the power of God, and then also the human being. This is Sirrul Qadr. This is the secret of destiny. And in our theology, we have a doctrine that we call the doctrine of Kesb, which is the doctrine of acquisition, that human beings <clears throat> are empowered through their knowledge, which is temporal, through their irada, which is temporal, and their power, which is haditha, temporal, to acquire their actions which God creates. He tests you and then you take it or you leave it. So inshallah we will leave it at that tonight. This is a very important position. And in the history of Islam, among Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the notion of jabr, that God makes you do it, that you have no choice. This was rejected as kufr. And the idea that you are totally free, mufawwad ilayk al-amr, musallat ala al-amr, you know, which is the position of the qadariya, this also was not acceptable. Whether it was kufr or not, that was a difference of opinion. But again, as Imam Al Ali says, and Imam Al Hassan and others, Al Amru Bain Al Bain. La Jabr wa la Tafweed, la Ikraha wa la Tasleed. And in one transmission of Imam Al Hassan, he says the difference between these two Bains is uh, Asha, uh, is, is, is vaster you know, than the difference between the heavens and the earth. So, inshallah, we will talk about this. May Allah give us understanding. Bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Um, okay, so uh, how would you translate Allah is munazzah? So when we speak of God in the aqidah, especially the negative attributes, um, we are doing this by way of tanzih. Tanzih. Tanzih, as you know in Arabic, is the declaration of God as being perfect and having no fault. Uh, how do we translate this word in English? Uh, it's a very good question. Some of our great scholars have used the word transcendent. And some of our good translations, you'll see that God is transcendent. I don't like that word myself. And how, and so we can say that he has no fault, he lacks fault, we need to find a better translation. And this is one of the things that those of us who are English speakers, uh, it's very important for us, you know, to get together in a symposium and to work on good translations. We have, mashallah, right now in the English language, beautiful translations of many texts. And people like Mukhtar Holland, who died Last year, Allah have mercy upon him, was a great man in my belief. And he was a good translator. 
He is a translator's translator. Nuh Keller is a great translator. A Sidi Abdul Hakim Winter is a great track. Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. So I think that really for us in this English speaking community, it's important for us to study this now. That what are the words we want to use and why? The word transcendence, um, I don't like. And this is again because God is not in the world and God is not outside the world. God is not indwelling and he is not outdwelling. He is not in me, he is not outside of me. He is not in time and space. And historically, the concept of transcendence was one of the most destructive of all religious beliefs. Transcendence means literally to go beyond. Transcend. Send is to go. Trans to go beyond. So transcendence as a Greek philosophical concept and as a pagan philosophical concept in, uh, in Egypt, in, the, in late antiquity, in Platonism, you know, in many philosophies, was a belief that God is outside the world. God transcends the world. God is above the seventh heaven. And if we study the history of Christianity, this is one of the most important things because the, we talk about cognitive frames. Um, Christianity was a religion that was given to the children of Israel. And the children of Israel, they believed in a way very similar to the way that you and I believe. And salvation for them, and Najah, was ethical salvation. That you believe in God and you do good. And inshallah, God will forgive you. And God will take you to the garden. When Christian belief goes beyond the children of Israel, it comes into the world of late antiquity, late Rome. And that is a world in which the beliefs of the Greek-speaking people, uh, the Coptic-speaking people, uh, Syrian, Syriac speakers, many people, it was radically dualistic. And Aristotelian and Platonic thought also has this dualism in it. So in this dualism, <clears throat> it was believed that the world is a defective place. And often is believed that matter, which is the basic thing in this world, is impure and it is cursed. And it is dank and dark and it brings death. And you have then in this world the human soul. And the human soul is divine. It is a spark of divinity. And it is, in, it is imprisoned in my body. So in order to be saved, uh, I have to have a savior. A sota, as they said in Greek, sota. I have to have a savior. And this savior, you have it in the cult of Isis, you have it in Mithraism, you have it in Neoplatonism, you have it in Stoicism, you have it in many different religious beliefs. But this, this savior has to be divine and he has to be able to come down into the world and to take my soul and to take it up to God who transcends. This was a standard belief. And therefore, here in Egypt, you know, when Arius of Alexandria, Arius of Alexandria was one of the great people in the church, in my opinion. <clears throat> Arius of Alexandria was a mufessor. He was not a philosopher. Many people say of him, he was a philosopher. And he couldn't accept that God was, you know, Jesus Christ. Or, no, that's not true. Arius of Alexandria was a mufessor of the Bible. And he was a conservative Christian. Because in Egypt, like all parts of the early Christian world, you had people who were heirs of the Church of Jerusalem, the Church of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in Jerusalem. Arius is one of those. Arius dressed in white. You know, he usually showed his arm. He was barefoot. Um, he dressed like the disciples of Christ himself. He was very conservative. And... His opposition 
to those who wanted to deify Jesus Christ was a conservative Christian opposition. When Arius says that Jesus cannot be God, that he must be created, and it's very interesting because Arius in the debates, you know, the main person who debated in Egypt, do you know what his name was? He's also an Egyptian. His name was Athanasius. Athanasius. Athanasius was, you know, these are Greek speakers. They're Egyptians. Maybe they could speak Coptic, but usually they're Greek speaking Egyptians because Greek was the dominant intellectual language of Egypt at that time. Athanasius, when he speaks, when he debates with Arius, he says that if Jesus Christ were not completely God, he could not be a savior. Okay? So, like, if I read that, when I read that, it's like, what? If Jesus were not totally God, he could not be a savior. What's going on? See, this is cognitive frames. Because for Athanasius and for Gregory and for Basil, for these church fathers, Origen as well, Origen's also an Egyptian, for them, in their Greek logic, their Greek dualism, God is outside the world. He's not in the world. And the world, which is matter, is not good. It is the source of evil. This is why the monasteries here in Egypt often were based on imatit and myths. You know, you have monks. You can see it. You've probably seen it yourself in monasteries here. I've seen it where the monks would tie their hair in knots against the wall so they could never sleep. They could never sleep. And he'll drop his head like that, but his, his hair is tied to the wall. And it, he wants to get out of his body. He wants to get out of his senses. He wants to liberate his nefs. Very interesting concepts, you know. But he must have a savior who is also divine, who can then take his ruh up to the transcendent God. This is the cognitive frame. You see? And this is what Arius of Alexandria was against. Because he said, this is not the biblical teaching. This is not the biblical teaching. And it's very interesting because, you know, in Surat Ali Imran, when Allah says, He said, it is He, God, who revealed the book. You know, um, you know, of it, there are muhkamat, there are verses that are absolutely clear. La ilaha illallah. La ilaha illa huwa. Laysa kemithlihi shayt. Walam yakun lahu kufuun ahad. Muhkamat. Hunna ummul kitab. They are the foundation of the book. They are the meaning of the book that all other interpretations must go back to. Wa ukharu mutashabiha. And there are other verses that are similar. They speak of God in a way that is similar to creation. Okay? Um, and so the, the verse makes it very clear, you know, that, uh, yani, that we base our religion on the muhkamat. When were these verses revealed? They were revealed, according to some of our scholars, Ibn Taymiyyah, for example, in his book, Al-Jawab al-Sahih, which is a very good book. It's probably the best book Ibn Taymiyyah ever wrote, in my opinion. Al-Jawab al-Sahih is a very good book. In that, he says, and other Mufassirs hold that position, they have other opinions as well. They say that this was revealed when Weftu Najran came to visit the Prophet in Medina. Weftu Najran was the biggest delegation that ever came to the Prophet Wasallam, And, you know, they came early in the Medinan period. I don't know if you remember, maybe the third year? I don't know, I don't remember. Was it the third year? I don't remember. It's in the early period. And it was a big delegation of Christians from the Najran. And there were Trinitarian Christians. And there were others as well. That's what they say. They, they had different points of view. But, you know, the leaders of that delegation, when they come to the Prophet, they try to use the mutashabihat of the Qur'an to justify the Trinity. That God speaks of himself, for example, as inna and nahnu and so forth. And that's when this was revealed. In fact, you know, maybe the first 70 verses, a number of verses of Ali Ibn they were... And this is amazing because this was also Arius's position. Arius, he said that 
in interpreting the Bible, we must follow the muhkamat. That the Bible, which is a beautiful text, you know, I mean, it has historical problems, it has linguistic problems, and it has to be studied very carefully and with great respect. But the Bible is very clear that God is one, that God is not like anything in the heavens and the earth or the sea, and you can make no image to him, and so forth. So he said that whatever we understand about the Gospels, about the greatness of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, it cannot contradict that. He can, whatever you say, you cannot make him a god. So this was his position. And what he said, Athanasius and others do, were doing is you are taking verses that are mutashabihat, such as references to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You know, usually in the Bible, Jesus is referred to as Baur Isha. Baur Isha, which means what? Baur is Ibn. Isha is what? Al Ins. Al Insan. Ibn al Insan. So he is Baur Isha. He is the Son of Man. That's usually the way that he's referred to. But he says that, you know, you cannot take these verses, which are also, you have verses like that in the Bible about Adam. You have verses like that about Jacob. You have verses like that about other great prophets. You cannot understand them in a way that contradicts the muhkamat. So this is really, really interesting. But in any case, transcendence is a very uh, problematic word in the history of religion. And that's the reason why I don't like to use it. But again, we need a good word for tanzi. We need a very good word for that. بِإِذْنِ ta'ala. Um, <clears throat> how can we use, train, practice, exercise our intellect? Shouldn't we believe that we are insignificant given God's creation, will, and power? Okay, two questions. So, the first one is, <clears throat> I think, a very good question, and it is an imperative. Uh, when we were teaching in Turkey, uh, last summer, and my sister Nelly was there, and uh, you know, this other sisters, other sisters were there as well. Um, some of the brothers may have been there. Some of the brothers were there, right? But uh, this was actually one of the things that came up in Turkey: is that how do we understand intellect? And um, so, I think that really, in writing about this aqidah and uh, pray for me, I hope to write a book about the Aqidah that explains this in good English, but I think this is one of the things that we have to do, is that we have to have exercises, you know, in the use of pure reason. And um, therefore, like in reading these traditional texts, one of the things that I and some of my friends have begun to do is just to take out examples, because they have it, they, they use the intellect in many different ways, and so, let's just look at this, see how they use it, see how they work with it, and get accustomed to it. We have to train ourselves to do that. And um, a lot of the, some of the traditional scholars, like as sibai he actually says that. If you don't know the necessity of the necessary, you don't know the impossibility of the impossible, you don't know the possibility of the possible, then you have to work on that. You have to train yourself. You have to get, you have to become familiar with it. I had to do that myself. Because like many of you, or most of you, or all of you, uh, I was brought up in the West and we're never taught about intellect. We're basically taught that intellect has nothing to say. And, uh, you know, so inshallah, uh, shouldn't we believe that we are insignificant given God's creation, will, and power? Um, you know, what are my awsaf? What are my essential attributes? <clears throat> they're the same as yours. And they're the same as this pillar. And they are iftiqar. Yet I am utterly contingent. And therefore, how can I be proud? How can I say I'm better than anyone else? You know, any gift that I have, God gave me that gift. Any gift that you have, God gave you that gift. You know, so we are insignificant in the sense that we are dhalil. We are dhalil. That this is my reality. God is an aziz. And again, we, we want to be strong people. We want to be dominant people. We want to be successful in life. We don't want people to walk over us, right? That's all sharia. But in your heart of hearts, it's like, who am I? 
Like, is there any room in your heart to be proud? Is there any room in your heart to be arrogant? Is there you know, any room in your heart not to be merciful or not to be thankful? Because, you know, everything we have is a gift of God. And in the path of Ihsan, this is one of the highest levels of all. When you begin to have mushahada, when you actually witness the way that God is miraculously working with you in your life. In every breath that you breathe, he has a special destiny in you that he fulfills. So when I begin to see that, my life is transformed. And then I live in the present moment. And then, you know, we can serve God. And we can be enlightened in the present moment. Lots of questions. And they're good questions. Uh, is it useful to wonder about whether the, is it useful to wonder about whether the heliocentric or geocentric worldviews are more correct? Was the Catholic Church right in its desire to present Galileo's findings? You know, so you know, we're not going to say that the Earth is flat, okay, and we're not going to say that the sun actually goes around us. We have very good proof to the contrary, right? Um, that's not what it's about, but. Again, the medieval human beings and ancient human beings, they believe that. They believe that the world is that way. The earth is in the center, we are in the earth, the sun rises, we are in the center. So theologically, that was very useful for them. When uh, Copernicus develops the, um, the uh, solar the idea that the earth goes around the sun, and in fact, uh, Muslims had pretty much worked that out before him, uh, at least uh, Arabs had, Abdullah al-Battani and others, they had really worked out that before Copernicus. But, um, you know, then this creates a great problem in the West, and that is that human beings are becoming more and more insignificant, that we are not the measure of all things. We are not the center of all things. So when tonight we say that we are the center of all things, we're not talking about a geocentric universe. Okay, we're not talking about that. But we are saying that you are the center of the universe. And this is because of the fact that in all created things, atoms and molecules and plants and stars, you are a very special one. You are the one who is created with the ability to know God in the most perfect way, and also to serve God in the most perfect, perfect way. However, there is a book that uh, came out not too long ago, and what's his name? Smith is his name? Is it, huh? Yeah, what is that book? Again, Sheikh Hamza is the one you want to talk about. You asked Sheikh Hamza about a geocentric world, and he can give three lectures. You know, because, again, cognitive frames. So there is a great thinker who is in the West today, and do you know his name? Uh, I think he has a German first name and an English second name. But um, he's actually shown that, while we don't deny the reality that the Earth goes around the Sun, that you can construct your physical view of the world in such a way that you still put the Earth in the center. And Sheikh Hamza is very excited about that. He's not going to say the earth is flat. And he's not going to say that, you know, actually, you know, it's not. But the thing is, is that, again, it's the way cognitive frames work. And these are, you know, very important uh, considerations. Um, <clears throat> so this is a question about the Qadariya. You said that they have false beliefs. Can you clarify? Uh, we'll do that in the days ahead, inshallah, okay? We talked about them a little bit tonight, and we'll talk about them later, inshallah. Um, wow, three questions. We'll look at that later. Um, what about saying, the heavens and the earth cannot contain me, <coughs> but the heart of the believer can contain me? So this is Hadith Qudsi, and um, this is a Sahih Hadith Qudsi, uh, my servant does not approach me by, how does, you know, that, how does the hadith go? That, um, you know, مَن تَقَرَّبِ إِلَيَّ شِبْرًا تَقَرَّبْتُ إِلَيْهِ ذِرَاعًا وَمَن تَقَرَّبِ إِلَيَّ ذِرَاعًا تَقَرَّبْتُ إِلَيْهِ ذَاعًا وَمَن أَتَانِي يَمْشِي, is it? أَتَيْتُهُ هَرْوَلًا 
Yeah, and um, then it says, you know, so th this is a part of a big Hadith Qudsi, very, very beautiful. And in it, um, I believe it's in the same Hadith, or it might be in another one. I'm actually not certain about that at the moment. It's another Hadith? Yeah, thank you. But in this, you know, the heavens and earth can, cannot, cannot contain me, but, um, you know, the heart of the believing servant can contain me. Okay, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam an Rabbihi. And, you know, this is about Haqiqah. This is about the Haqiqah. And it's about the secret of the human heart. And <clears throat> it's about the fact that the human being <clears throat> is that created being who can know God in the most comprehensive way of all. And we talked about the 99 names. As we said, the names of God are infinite. And the 99 names are very special names of God that perfectly reflect God as creator in the world. And if we know those names and we honor them, then God will grant us paradise, bi ta'ala. But um, these names are reflected in all things. So, for example, the tree, plants in general, they manifest the name Ar-Razak. Because everything about plants, you know, the wood, the fruit, the grass, the hay, you know, you know, it's all rizq. They give shelter, they give shade, and so forth. So you have the name of ar razaq which is there in the tree, or in the wheat plant, or whatever it may be. And then also you have other names, Al-Hakim, Al-Rahim, you know, Al-Mu'ti, and so forth. All of these names are there in creation. This is why creation is also an ayah that speaks about God. And also, if we go back to the question that was asked earlier, this is one of the reasons why the language we use is valid. But this is a haqiqah, it's not part of the aqidah. But, um, you know, um, the heavens and the earth cannot contain me. God is not in time and place. But the believing servant, you know, who purifies himself or herself, and who knows their Lord, and who gets everything out of their heart, you know, all attachment to the world, all attachment to fame, all attachment to the love of leadership, which is the most difficult thing of all. We all want to be leaders, right? We all want to be sitting up here with the big desk, and you know, we all want to be you know, the head of the firm. This is hard. You know, this is the most difficult thing to get rid of takes a lot of tarbiyah, you know, and people, you know, so, uh, you know, these things, if we get them out of the heart and we have knowledge, then God illuminates the heart and he fills it with light. And we have what we call anwar al-wusul and anwar al-dukhul. You know, you have lights that come to your heart because you're pure and you're sincere that enable you to understand, that enable, that enable you to believe, that enable you to grasp the things that we're talking about, right? These are anwar al-wusul, because they come to the heart. Then you have the anwar al-dukhul. These are lights that come to the heart. They say they're like, they sometimes compare them to birds. You know, that if you have birds come to your backyard, you know, they won't eat from the feeder if there's a cat. You know, in fact, they have to make sure that it's safe, that there's nothing there. Then they come and they eat take from the feeder. So also the anwar al-dukhul, if they come to the heart and the heart is filled with doubts and preoccupations and, and ta'alluqat, you know, that I'm, my concern is me, my concern is my career, my concern is my sum'ah, my fame, then they won't come in. But when that is not there and the heart is pure, and this is, you know, the, one of the realities of ihsan, then they fill the heart. And this is what they're talking about. So they say that Al-Arsh, Arsh Ar-Rahman, Al-Arsh Istawa, in the heart. These are haqqa'iq, you know. Again, we don't talk about that in Aqidah. Aqidah talks about the things that there's no problem for anybody to believe in it, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Why is thermodynamics a proof that the world has a creator? Well, it's not. Thermodynamics is a proof that the world has a beginning. Right? And um, you can go back and uh, this is probably written by somebody who came tonight for the first time. Right? So you're most welcome. 
And your question is an honorable question, but we talked about it three nights in a row. So uh, if you want to go back to the earlier lectures, I think you'll find enough there to understand it, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala. But this is because energy balances out in the material world. So if this world didn't have a beginning, it would be eternal. And if it were eternal, you have all the time you need. So that would mean that all of the energy in the universe would have been distributed. And today, in the present moment, after eternity, um, we wouldn't be here and nothing else would be here. The fact that the world is not like that and that energy is not distributed, this means that this world has a beginning in time. Okay, so that's a strong proof. If it has a beginning in time, then it's muftakir. And then it has to have a creator who is not like that. And Sir Isaac Newton, who believed in the oneness of God, and he was a Unitarian, he did not believe in the Trinity. Sir Isaac Newton, understanding the reality of thermodynamics, he says this is proof that God exists. Um, what is the soul, nafs? Um, is it something that talks to us like shaitan? And what is the difference between me and my nafs? And how can I control my nafs to reach the point to make my nafs give me the right advice? Very good question. Uh, inshallah we can talk about it a little bit. It's not aqidah. But, um, you know, Imam al-Ghazali, may Allah be pleased with him, in the second half of Ihya, he has Ajaib al-Qalb. And one of the things he says there, these are really amazing. This is actually about Maratib al-Wujud. Imam al-Ghazali is very shar'i. Imam al-Ghazali is very careful in the Ihya, never to go outside the Sharia. He wants to do Ihya ulum al -Din. He wants to bring the deen to light. He wants you to understand the secrets of wudu, the secrets of salah, the secrets of psalm, so that you believe in this religion. And his book is very beneficial. Very, very beneficial. But when he talks about Ajaib al-Qalb in part two of the Ihya, one of the things he says is that, that these are words that all mean the same thing. The nafs, the aql, the qalb, and the ruh. They're all the same things. And, um, you know, they, uh, when, you know, they are not properly developed, you know, then, you know, they can have certain negative properties. But as they are developed, as they are trained, as they are purified, then the nafs becomes an aql, it becomes a ruh, you know, it becomes a qalb, and it receives these great things. So this is purification of the heart. It's one of the most important tasks of all. And this is the secret of the path of ihsan. You know, and ta'budu Allah ka'annaka tara. فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَى And that takes good company. You know, I believe this is good company. I believe all of you are good company. But we need to keep good company. And also you have to have people who understand these things. And, you know, who can guide us along this path. Out of time. Out of time, right? Who said yes? Barakallahu fiki. Barakallahu fiki. Ana muwafiq. Ana muwafiq. Allah muwafiqna lima tuhibbuhu wa tadda wa ja'alna min abidika su'ada wa amitna ala kalimat al-huda alimna ma yanfa'na wa wafiqna lil'amali bima alamtana bih wa ja'alna nahnu fihi khalisan mukhlisan li wajhika al-kareem ya rabbil alameen Allahumma ja'al tajammu'na hadha tajammu'an marhuman wa tafarruquna ba'duhu tafarruquan ma'asuman la shaqiyan minna wa la mahruman ameen ameen I'm going to keep all your questions and I appreciate these questions they're very very useful for me and uh, I'm sorry if we don't answer them well enough. Try to answer it quickly. But uh, inshallah, uh, we'll try to come back to them. And uh, I hope to see you tomorrow. <laughs>